phones up. Dr. Steve Pachinik is an MD and a PhD psychiatrist, an American uh, former State Department official, author and publisher. Wrote a bunch of books with Tom Clancy like Net Force and Op Center. Produced a bunch of big films. StevePachinik.com is his website. Trained in psychiatry at Harvard University and International Relations at MIT. His novels are based on over 20 years' experience resolving international crises and hostage situations for the Department of State for four administrations. He was also instrumental uh, in the Camp David Accords as well, and I'm witness to that. And he joins us. I want to cover the waterfront, if you can, in little nodes here and get your take on a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, Boko Haram is on record being protected by Hillary Clinton, who I know you don't think is too bad. I mean, it's kind of... Interesting who you like and who you don't like, but we'll see what you say today. She didn't want them designated as a terror group. Now this is happening. Looks staged to me. So is this even really Boko Haram? Who knows? Uh, I want to get your take on the latest on the Benghazi committee. You say you've got intel on that. Uh, I want to get into what's happening in Syria, Ukraine. I want to cover the waterfront with uh, Dr. Steve Pachinik. Doc, it's good to have you back on with us. You also wrote a book, started writing a book I know three years ago. I was seeing this on the news. Uh, with the late Tom Clancy, so that got held up. So you wrote it, he wrote it, you finished it up with a couple of authors. So uh, I guess you guys were working on a book about the Syria civil war before it started or right as it was beginning to start. So I want to get your take on Out of the Ashes uh, that's about to be uh, published or is, is, is coming out very soon. So, Doc, good to have you with us. A lot to cover. It's a, it's a grand pleasure to be with you, Alex. It's a wonderful time to always talk to your audience. There's a lot we're going to have to cover. The new book with Tom Clancy, Steve Pachenik, but written by George Galderisi and Dick Couch, two excellent military experts who've been in the military, are still involved with national security, have written an excellent book, which we wrote about two to three years ago, predicting the ongoing slaughter in Syria and the fact that Syria, uh, Tehran, Iran, and Russia would be aligned against Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, and basically uh, not get in, uh, the United States involved. But it was a uh, war between the Shiites, the Sunni, and Muslims against the Christians. And what we wrote out of the ashes was that this is a complicated situation. We brought in the Navy, uh, Special Forces, George Galderisi, and Dick Couch did an excellent job of describing the various techniques that we would have used and have been using in Syria and the fact that we are using now special forces and CIA operators out of Jordan who've been uh, titrated, vetted out, and guns were shipped into Syria. Now, let me get out of the book for a minute, and I think everybody should really take a look at that book. But let's talk about Benghazi. Why does Benghazi relate to Syria, and why is now the investigation done by Trey Gowder a very important investigation? Because for the most part, uh, Hillary Clinton is responsible for a lot of the negligence that was in, uh, involved in the State Department in terms of their indifference to what happened to Benghazi. I don't have to go over the entire story. But the key of the entire Benghazi investigation under the new federal prosecutor who comes out of South Carolina, and I have a lot of respect for him, is the fact that Trey Gowdy, who is a federal prosecutor, is a Republican, but is very neutral, is really has to look at the new uh, people who he has to bring uh, subpoenas to. And that's not necessarily Hillary Clinton or Jerry or, or uh, John Kerry. The following people should be subpoenaed. Number one is the people in the White House. Because what this is, and really what happened in Benghazi, is a rogue operation that's consistent with what happened to William Colby in the 1970s under the Church Committee, most people in the media really do not know what they're talking about. The only media that really had an, uh, a very clear understanding was that for, uh, Fred Murdoch's and Roger Ailes' understanding that this was a coup attempt to get David Petraeus out by John Brennan. So what we're talking about now is that John Brennan, who is now the director of the CIA, but at the time, when Benghazi occurred, he was an assistant to the President of the United States. He had no immunity whatsoever. He ran an illegal rogue operation, which was called SOCOM, Special Operations Command, which was a paramilitary unit that undermined David Petraeus, who was the head of the CIA, and they weren't running an embassy 
in Libya. That's why Hillary Clinton could claim, well, that wasn't really our involvement. By the way, you said this weeks after it happened, and now a right. lot of it has come out, uh, that indeed it was a clandestine arms shipment to the jihadis. It's not only, that's correct, Alex, as usually you're correct. Not only was a clandestine arm uh, shipment to the uh, jihadis, but it was also a terror uh, center, and it was not an official embassy. That's why the ambassador happened to be there, but he waived any protection. That's why he said basically to Eric Boswell and Pat Kennedy of the State Department, whom I knew, that I'm, I'm taking care of. But he had nothing to do with the buildings that we've seen and where the violence occurred. That was a counselor office, which is not under the protection of the State Department, but is actually a safe house where the CIA and SOCOM were able to interrogate prisoners, uh, terrorize them, and then ship guns out of there. So the real focus has to, has to go back to Obama, where he could be impeached for lying, for Valerie Jarrett, who's part of the White House, for Tom Donlin, who was there, Ben Rhodes, and David Petraeus, who was undermined as the director of the CIA by John Brennan and sending his SOCOM troops under the direction of McRaven and the Navy and paramilitary organizations. So what we have here is a rogue operation that harks back to the 1970s when William Colby was running rogue operations under the CIA. But in this case, the CIA was directed by Petraeus, and it was an attempt by John Brennan, who was a consultant to the director, uh, to the president, who tried to undermine Petraeus and got rid of him and then used the sure. uh, 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 libelous. So what we have here is a very important chance for the American government to look at a period of time which is not McCarthyism in terms of Republican in, in, insights and investigation, but in terms of a McCarthyism that's replete and orchestrated by the Obama administration. Well, let me stop you right there, because undoubtedly, let's pull back. Undoubtedly, Turkey's been caught running false flags to blame Syria. Nobody's romanticizing Assad, but you knew the father and the son. I want you to talk about that. Uh, expanding now, the al-Qaeda forces that have been built up in western Iraq are now even allowed to attack uh, a major city. So that's a pretext for more occupation of Iraq, the order out of chaos system, with these corporate interests who don't have America's interest at heart, but only have destabilization at heart. And then I tie that into now the globalists using Libya as an AFRICOM base to launch all sorts of destabilization operations all over Africa, from Uganda right over to Sierra Leone, uh, right over to the Ivory Coast, uh, right over to Nigeria. I mean, really, aren't we seeing kind of a great game, a, a Zbigniew Brzezinski program that then kind of meets a neocon program? Because we, you know, we can say it's a rogue operation. We know they always allow groups to, quote, operate rogues. So they can deny it later. But there is a certified move by Obama to arm the Saudi Arabian and Qatari uh, al-Qaeda people to attack Assad. Well, here's, that's correct. Uh, Alex, you're absolutely correct. What happened, however... Like all arming of terrorist groups, there was a blowback back to the Saudi government. In the past two, three weeks, I have been informed and I've been monitoring the situation where the Suleimani brothers, it's only seven who control Saudi Arabia. They are not in good shape. They have lost their oil capability. They have lost, they have increased their unemployment, but they basically have now had to fight the very organizations that they created the Salafists, the Sufis, the Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda of Africa. So now they've been informed that they have to now fight the very organizations who were sent into Syria to fight against the... That's the intel that I was given. Let me stop you, that this is a quadruple cross by the globalist uh, to actually destabilize not just Syria and Iran, but to take down Saudi Arabia in the final equation. What's, what's your inside scoop on what they plan to replace it with? They're not going to replace Saudi Arabia with anything. Saudi Arabia is now a failed state, Alex. From my point of view, so that's what they want. It a, because it has 40% unemployment, it has water piercing right through its oil wells, it can no longer turn out the production of oil that we, the United States, do not need because we're net exporters of gas. So now the globalists are done with Saudi Arabia, now it's just going to be put into a failed state. It will be a failed state which ironically will align itself with Israel, which now feels totally disregarded, 
and, uh, and marginalized and turn working with UAE, United Arab Emirates, and at the same time working with Jordan. So you have a coalition of kind of quasi-marginalized groups, which will be not relevant to our strategic interests. Our strategic interests are now moving to SYNCPAC, or the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Ocean, with regard to China, China's war with Japan, and China's war with Vietnam. And that's what I wrote about 20 years ago in Pac sure. Pacifica, where, in fact, the Chinese are going out of their way to create a problem in a small group of islands, which are 120 miles and is that what the, uh, I want to come back then after this break and break sure. down the geopolitical no, ramifications, but I remember you on this show about three, four years ago, talking about the pivot before it happened, and then talk about strategically then how how uh, the system knew and, 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 and kind of what some of the power blocks are inside sure. the Anglo-American establishment, because I know there's different sure. factions, but... You know, the faction I don't like is the one teaching kids two plus two equals five. It's the faction saying there shouldn't be fathers and families. It's the faction not letting us have power plants. I, I mean, I want to talk about the factions here that, that are running this country into the ground because they do some things that help the country and the people and then other things that hurt us. So I want to talk to Steve Pachinik, who's an insider's insider, straight ahead. His new book uh, that he and Tom Clancy were working on. Uh, is now being uh, published uh, posthumously. When you're as big a writer as Pachinik or Clancy, they just have guys that basically they work with it and kind of publicly ghostwrite it. So he talked about those two Navy guys that have uh, put the book out. So that's uh, coming out as well. It's all coming up. This is not uh, your daddy's talk radio. This is real analysis, deep information. About the CIA's ties to Boko Haram. This is a destabilization force. I don't even blaming the CIA. There's a whole bunch of groups that want destabilization. And, you know, I can sit back and see the plan to destabilize Saudi Arabia, the plan to destabilize Iran, the plan to destabilize Ukraine, the plan to destabilize, you know. But then the very same globalists that are doing that, arguing they want to build this world government to stop war, are the ones trying to break up families, cut off our energy, using their power to consolidate control. So... Uh, I don't see the New World Order, as George Herbert Walker Bush called for it, bringing stability or order. I see it bringing disorder. And, of course, the Russians have their New World Order. The Chinese have their New World Order. All I see is a bunch of kleptocrats excusing their predatory actions. And it's the opposite of a society that I think is going to survive. Dr. Pachinik, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there on the table. I, I can see the great game, the divide and conquer, all of it. But America really is losing its moral high ground. Who are the players in the power structure from your perspective? Players in the power structures are, number one, the banking industry, the oil uh, conglomerates that come out. You have uh, the major energy companies coming out of Texas. You have the military-industrial complex like Northrop Grumman, Lockheed, ATK, which provides uh, ammunition. You have Raytheon, which provides the military-industrial. You have a whole series of uh, beltway bandits who have nothing else to do except to take this rotational system of generals who have failed in the military. Get, they get their pensions of $150,000. they are offered $2 million, as they were in Booz Allen where Snowden came out of, and then they get retread again into a military-industrial complex. So we don't really have a government. What we have is an outsourcing machine, which we American people are paying twice for and getting no outside product. So what you have is not a unified world structure. What you have is a constant, ongoing system, which is a dysfunctional banking system of money just going around through military-industrial energy complex North of Brumman, CACI, CACI, SAIC, L3, MITRE, Blackwater, all of which are in the business of creating what, we, what Kissinger used to call strategic tension or problems, and then they ship that out to our military or paramilitary units. And what happens in the paramilitary units, they're under the control of the CIA. That has to be stopped. All paramilitary units have to go back into the military, and the CIA has to be investigated. They have to be completely cleaned out, and John Brennan has to go in front of the Benghazi committee without immunity because he's on an accepted service, and, and the prosecutor uh, has to start questioning him as he did William Colby in the old I want to get into that with you and talk about a bunch of other big issues that tie together and where you see the world going with Dr. Steve Pachenik.
SteveBachanik.com. The world government is the world government does not exist at the world government. What is in fact happening is we are losing our our priority in the world systems on several levels. Number one, because we have weak leadership consistent from Clinton on Bush Jr. to Obama, who's a disaster, a man who never had a job, a man who never had an executive position, a man who never even was a senator. He was a false senator, wrote a book, who came out of the CIA, had never had any experience, and they cannot make any decision. He's run by a woman named Valerie Jarrett in the White House, who comes of uh, Chicago. Her father was in Iran, probably was a CIA operative. He comes out of the CIA, went to Occidental College, which was the CIA agency, and never really had any experience. He is totally incompetent, dysfunctional. A man like Putin, who's been in the intelligence community, sees it very clearly, sees his indecisiveness, sees the fact that we have no strategic sense, either in Crimea or Ukraine, which, by the way, Crimea does belong to Russia. I was there when we took down the Soviet Union, and it was an informal agreement that Crimea would always remain to the Soviet system or the Russian system because it's the only port which belongs to Russia, and it's the only place where the Russian battleships and Navy can get out of on a warm water port. So it's not a question of Anschluss or NAS, NAS, uh, Nazi annexation. It was all started by, again, incompetent people under John Kerry by the name of Valerie uh, Newland, who's an assistant secretary of state for uh, Victoria Newland, who's assistant secretary of state for Western Europe, probably a CIA cover, was uh, uh, related to a neocon, started all these problems while Putin was in Sochi and started to create what we call agitation propaganda. Agitation propaganda. Agiprop. Stay, stay there, Dr. Pachinik. I want to come right back and break all this down and where you see it going because... Look, Obama is so busy trying to wreck our education system, trying to target the Tea Party and gun owners and libertarians with Homeland Security. I want to talk about the degeneracy infesting the ruling class of really wanting to undermine their, their empire. I mean, it, it's crazy. We'll be right back. I want the truth. 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 I get the truth at SteveTalks.tv. 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 Three one three nine. Now I'm going to try to shut up and give you the floor, Dr. Pachenik, so you can really get rolling here. But we can look at all the battlefields and all the manipulations and all the special interests and all the Obama vacationing more than any other president and. Uh, the authoritarianism of, of the first lady saying, don't say bossy and uh, all the rest of it. And Hillary, you know, saying, let's save the girls when she wouldn't put Boko Haram on the terror list. The degeneracy of the system, uh, the corruption, the disconnect, the Obama saying raising the debt limit doesn't raise the debt. Saying, if you have a business, you didn't build that. Uh, the communist slogans lean forward right out of Karl Marx on MSNBC and CNN. I mean, really, I never believed it was a communist conspiracy. I knew that special interests used that to domesticate people. But now I realize that the only ones active and mobile in the corrupt corporate system are a bunch of really sickening authoritarian folks that are calling for the arrest of anybody who is right of uh, Mao Zedong. And I see the CIA helping put Mao in and all this. I mean, it really freaks me out to think, who are the ruling class? What is the ideology? Why do they hate Christians so much, Dr. Pachenik? Well, number one, I don't think there's any more of what we would call a ruling class. What we have is just 
we have a fractionation of a government. And basically, in some ways, it's really quite good because we have a totally incompetent president followed by a formerly incompetent president followed by a formerly immoral incompetent president. So for 30 years, we have had no one who's really been in charge and has had any capability to run this country. However, that doesn't mean they're not vitriolic and they were not dangerous. As you know, Bush Jr. initiated 9-11 initiated the Iraq war, and then lied. What we have here with Obama is a total sociopath, quite ignorant, quite incompetent. I've said it for years from the beginning, Alex, when you and I talked, very dysfunctional. He's a product of Valerie Jarrett. He's a product of the uh, banking system and the uh, Pfizer, uh, Pfizer companies, the big pharma, where he gave them $80 billion dollars for a very dysfunctional health care system called Obamacare. And now what you have is basically companies on their own saying, you know what, the hell with America. And they really don't care. The companies have become basically these egregiously greedy, self-important companies that have no loyalty to the United States. For example, Pfizer, one of the biggest billion-dollar companies in the United States, that supplies our medicine has decided to leave our tax system and do what we call an inversion and go to England so that they can buy a lousy company called AstraZeneca, which is worth nothing on the equity basis in order to avoid our taxes. So the job of all of our companies has not been to be an American company or a flagship, but it's to avoid taxes, to produce the greatest amount of profit, and to make sure that they pay the least amount of money. So there's no sense of American affiliation. Where does that come from? It comes from the very top, as you correctly stated. Is there a wild, wide cabal? No, because it's so fractionated. It is so self-oriented. It is so egregiously greedy and dysfunctional that what's happening is everybody now is going out on their own, even our own generals have never stood up for Benghazi. Instead of saying after eight hours of monitoring the situation and saying that this was a standout, this was a violation of military orders, and there was an illegal operation that went on, initiated by Brennan through SOCOM, Special Operations Command, they quietly left, got their pension funds, and said nothing. The same thing with our CIA. You have to remember we have created a welfare state within our military, within our CIA, within our government. That has to be taken down systematically, and we don't have legislators for that. So well, I was that about to say, to I mean, uh, from what I know, just 20, 30 years ago, most people who were in the CIA uh, were, were – mainly Christians, uh, conservative types, maybe misguided, but super focused, top of their class. Nowadays, because they're all over the place, they like triple the size of it. It's literally guys just sitting around bragging that they're in the CIA to girls and walking around with black suits and black sunglasses, uh, just acting like they're secret police. And I mean, this, uh, more and more we're acting like a third world country is what I'm saying. Exactly. I'm saying you're correct. It's entered. We, we, we're spending a high, I want you to realize that we, the American people, among your audience, we're spending over $180 billion for intelligence that's worth nothing. Most of the CIA are outsourced. That's 70 to 80 percent of the people who work in the CIA really don't get paid by the CIA itself. They then join SAIC, CAIC, MITRE, all these cutout organizations that are totally worthless. And then you have all these think tanks. Then you have the Secret Service, which really never serves the American public, but serves their own needs and maintains that they protect the president. Protect the president are dispensable. The country is not dispensable. The office of the presidency is not dispensable. Yet not one Secret Service agent ever stood up and said, Obama's lying. Bush was lying. Clinton was lying. They never said a word. So their loyalty is not to the country. It is to their own jobs and their own sense of secrecy. So what we have is a government of military intelligence and secrecy within this republic which has never been opened up, which has never been fragmented by great Christians like General Eisenhower 
Even Jimmy Carter fired 9,000 CIA operatives, and they call him dysfunctional, yet he was the one who made a treaty between Israel and Egypt. I haven't seen any other president say it. And we have lost the Christian Judaic values of this country, and it became a monetary, greedy, self-absorbed country. Now, how does that relate to our education? Our education is a, a disaster. It is the disaster of the highest order. I've gone to Cornell, MIT, and Harvard, and I can tell you that each of those schools have literally whored their way into mercenary activity. I recently took a course at MIT on Internet Big Data. It was a terrible course, yet it gave away its MIT prestige because it needed the money. Now, one of the teachers was really an American, and those who were American knew nothing about banking, and knew nothing about finance. No, that's it. Yeah. Americans know how to act tough. Now, now the hardworking truck drivers and farmers and school teachers, people, they're all trying. But literally, anyone in the establishment now just goes around posing all day, talking about how smart they are. And I talk to executives and people now, and they don't know anything either. It's really scary. No. And not only it's scary, but you just had an example at Walmart where they lost money, yet the executives made money while the employees lost their money and lost the stock value. So you have a very criminal, inconsistent system where we don't have an oversight. Congress has to be eliminated. The entire system of Congress and the Senate is nothing more than a fancy welfare state unless we begin to bring in new parties. We can no longer have the Republican and Democrats. They're dysfunctional. They are sociopathic, and we need new parties that come up, be it the Tea Party in a new form, be it a Libertarian Party. We need more than two parties, and we need to break through this notion that if a Republican comes up or a Democrat, it's absolutely irrelevant. Look at the absurdity of where we've come. We've come through 30 years of disgrace, immorality, and a Christian values, and who would he come up with? Bush and Hillary Clinton. That is a disgraceful yeah, stigma on the American public to say these are the only two candidates that we have of a president. No, we should have had more candidates. We have great Americans, even like you. I don't care if you started a party. Oh. It's not relevant. I'm, I'm serious. And I don't care if a libertarian starts a party, Rand Paul, anyone. But they have to be able to break into the systems and have the experience at the executive sure, well, let me ask you this question, because you're a top analyst and the head of PSYOPs for the State Department and, and have run on just countless secret operations, so I respect your view on this. Where does your gut tell you, Dr. Pachinik, the world is going? What does your gut tell you is going to happen to Western civilization? You were starting to get into China and the, and the pivot there and, and what China was doing earlier when we went to break. Talk about that some. Well, my gut is telling me that things are not good in America overall. In terms of the overall regime of America, we no longer need it. I, I'm telling you from a gut level, having worked after five presidents, I want to inform your audience, a president is really only good for 100 days. The rest of the time, we're wasting money on a person just running around and bullshitting, quite frankly, just saying nothing and doing nothing. Whether it's Obama, whether it's Bush Jr., whether it's Clinton, whether it's any other president. So we don't really need it. We have to go back to our founding Christian fathers, like George Washington, who was very leery of having a president. Secondly, the Congress has to be disbanded, reoriented, along with the Senate, because that's nothing more than a welfare state. Number three, I'm very disappointed in our military. From my point of view, our military, professional military, is nothing more than a fanciful communist system where we take care of them from cradle to grave, very few of them ever been in combat. If they've been in combat, they show leadership. They never go up to the generalship. And the generals and the admirals then be go, become uh, executives at CASAIC, CACI, or North of Grumman, and they waste our money. So we're con constantly wasting our money. Our CIA is worthless. We have to completely get rid of it. We have 16 intelligence organizations. We don't need them. They haven't been effective. They have done absolutely nothing. Then we get back to the three branches of government. Now we get John Roberts, whom I do not respect, at the Supreme Court. This is an individual who's supposed to be Christian, yet he made one of the most stupid, 
illogical decision that a corporation has the freedom of speech. He was paid off. I can assure you he was paid off. I can assure you he has a questionable background as a Supreme Court justice. He was appointed by nobody else by the most than the stupidest Chief Justice Rehnquist, who Nixon hated. As much as we may have said bad things about Nixon, he cared about America. Well, that's why the establishment got rid of him, is because he wanted to be president, and they didn't want somebody acting like president. I agree with that. Let me ask you this question, then. Looking at where this is going, I mean, I know the military at the top sold out, but when it comes to the enlisted, the non-commissioned officers, and even low-level commissioned officers, they're some of the most professional, informed people, and they listen to this show. Almost everyone I talk to in the military on the street is a listener. I'm not bragging. It's actually pretty scary. No, I agree with you, and I want to address them personally, because I have repeatedly for three years asked for the re his resignation of General Shinseki, I knew he was incompetent. I knew he couldn't run the VA. And as I'm saying this to my VA veterans, and I'm a veteran, that he has to go. But he was so obstinate, so arrogant, and so incompetent that he remained there until men died. Now, I'm saying this to our military at the captain level, the lieutenant level, and the lieutenant colonel level. You will never have a chance to get promoted in a system where professionalism will be more important than competency and intelligence. And that's why we need new leaders like Eisenhower to clean out every one of those generals. If I came in as Secretary of Defense, I would have fired a thousand generals and admirals automatically, just to, like George Marshall did. So when we go back to the history of where we were the greatest, we had men who came in and dared to defy the system, Dare to say to the generals, you're not qualified. Well, in the old days, most qualified. of the generals were combat vets. Now I looked it up, most of them never even been in combat. Well, even the ones who were in combat vets, they had very little combat. I mean, Petraeus never really had combat vets. With all due respect to him, he was shot at a, at a shooting gallery and then promoted himself all the way to the top. I think it was through all generals. There are other four-star generals that the NSA never saw combat. 30 hours in Iraq is not combat. And I'm not talking about just combat. I'm talking about understanding the strategy, the tactics of war, and what is our national security interest, and how do you manipulate it? Now, one of our military or intelligence officers really get trained in psychological warfare, psychological determination, group dynamics. So now that they're going to have to confront China, I have a whole command of the Pacific who has to deal with problems of China becoming the number one power. By the way, China next week will be the number one gross economic country in the world. We have, we have become the number two. And China will now determine the force structures of where they will go in Southeast Asia, where they will deal with in Iran, where they will go in Saudi Arabia. They have uh, international connections to Africa, which we don't. So they don't care about human rights. What they care about is expansionism of money and power, and they are becoming extremely influential. There will be a point of confrontation now that I've never said before with China. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm not romanticizing Japan, but it looks like China is the one pushing it, saying we'll take islands, we're prepared for war. Uh, do you think they might actually try to take some of those islands or take Philippine yes. islands? Yes, I think. Here's the issue. When I wrote about Pax Pacifica, and some of us wrote in the Op Center books, about North Korea and the Chinese episode. I think we have another book coming out with George Galderisi and Dick Couch about the ongoing Chinese situation after out of the ashes. Basically, what we're saying now is China will be the dominant force in Southeast Asia. They will dominate Vietnam, Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, Brunei, all of those areas of that Southeast Pacific area. And the Pacific will be dominated by China. Now, we claim Hillary, who's totally ineffectual, has no legislative, no executive power, has been a liar since day one. Again, we're, we're promoting sociopaths in Hillary Clinton, in Obama, in the Bush family. What we need are people who've had real experiences and can come on the line. And we have military officers now who have to deal with China in a negotiated way also limit setting, and at the same time be able to confront what the Chinese call the cabbage strategy. The cabbage strategy is to lay in all kinds of boats 
and patrol boats around the Spratly Islands, the Paracel Islands. Why? Because there's oil. The most important uh, point of oil in the Southeast Asia is around these small Paracel Spratly Islands, and it's been there for over 20 to 30 years, and there will be a confrontation between the Chinese and the Vietnam, and it's occurred over the past four or five days. I wrote about it 20 years ago. I predicted it would happen. And I will predict that China will keep pushing and pushing until it gets into a All right, we're almost out of time. What do you think is going to end up happening in, in Ukraine? And w w what do you... Ukraine, well, Putin can only go so far. Putin is now hurting. Uh, we're hemorrhaging him economically. The, the, the ruble will go down. His bond rating went down to a junk bond. Basically, Putin is now the king of the junk bond. Ukraine is a dead asset. There will be no value to us in terms of going to war or doing anything in the Ukraine. There will be no civil war. Crimea does belong to the uh, Russia. It fought for it, lost over a million men in the Crimean War, lost 300,000 in battle. The British lost 100. The Turks lost 100,000. But it belongs to Russia. The rest of Ukraine he can have because it's a $15 billion dead asset. There's no money available. The Ukrainians have not developed anything, and they will have to make their own determination. The West Ukraine government is totally useless, and Victoria Highland can, uh, Newland can be the one who should be indicted for creating agitation propaganda as well as John. I, I can't believe, I, uh, exactly, I can't believe that they, they, they openly give speeches saying they've spent $5 billion to overthrow the country. And I can't believe they talk on telephones, not knowing the Russians are recording it. What is, I mean, they literally act like idiots. Well, not only the idiots, that's called agitation propaganda. That's why the CIA, which I think she really works for, and John Kerry, whose father worked for the CIA, I think he's nothing more than a tactical, kind of, I think, moron. Oh, you think they knew attacked. the Russians were listening and put it out? Yes. Of course they did. Alex, uh, you know, you know exactly he said, when she said fuck you to the European Union, she basically knew that she wanted it picked up because they're not naive. We monitor, we, not my, but they monitor, the NSA monitors, the Russians monitor, everybody monitors, and she did that purposely as part of agitation propaganda. It's a stupid tactic. It was a stupid strategy, and now we're paying a heavy price. But I agree with you. Putin doesn't want the rest of it because there's no assets there. No assets. It's a $15 billion dead asset. He can't do anything with it. He doesn't really want it. Uh, but Soros wants, wants it to, to say, oh, look, Europe's all screwed up. Give us trillions more as a banker bailout cover. Dr. Steve uh, Pachinik, uh, I really enjoyed you. Coming on stevepachinik.com, the new book that you co-authored or, or, or developed with Tom Clancy is coming out, Out of the Ashes. And we'll have you back again soon. I really appreciate you Thank coming you. on the broadcast. Thank you, everybody. Thank you always, Alex. Thank, Thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us.